Well, hey, everybody, it's Tuesday. <laughs> that means we look at a lot of charts and we've discovered some cool stuff today as well. So this will be a historic Octa, as many of them are, and tons and tons of learnings to happen. So let's go. Thank you all for being here. Them are. Thank you. And to tons and tons check. of learning. And my audio works. I always check that. I don't want to be talking to myself for five minutes. Let's jump in. This video is entitled Historical Course, but we're going to touch on a whole bunch of other stuff. Also, show some new dashboards that nobody has ever seen. And disclaimer, of course, none of this is financial advice, uh, but we'll be talking about historic gold cross, crypto market highlights, challenges, insights, bond market versus crypto, global developments, some investment opportunities. We're going to talk about Bitcoin, Cardano, Optimism, Solana, Matic, Ethereum, Tesla, debt, bonds, half-life of money, Canadian real estate market. Wow. <laughs> A lot for over 40 nuggets. So let's jump in. Oh, by the way, please subscribe to the channel. Uh, it takes me 10 seconds to say this. It reminds everybody to subscribe. If you want to amplify your intelligence, I promise you more information per minute here than anywhere else you can find on the internet. Thank you so much, Mr. Jeff Hammer, too. I see you out there. So let's talk about the market first. This is what happened over the last seven days divided by ETH. You can see again, just like last week, ETH beat Bitcoin. And XRP beat ETH and Solana beat ETH. So it was kind of an interesting week. And we will talk a bit about some of our favorite tokens as well. And we don't talk about them because we show them. We talk about them because we talk about the best assets. It's all we do. My philosophy is go hard early into very few assets that generate a ton of alpha. And it works. So let's talk about the market again in terms of US dollars over the last week. You can see here, same thing again, Bitcoin up 3.22%. We had a great pump over the weekend. Ethereum, 5%. Uh, and then you see again, XRP, VeChain, Solana, Filecoin, all up as well over this period in dark green, which is very, very good. Let's look at the stock market because that's been getting a lot of attention. Even for hardcore crypto only people, they start to look at stocks for the first time. Even crypto channels that never talk about stocks, they start talking about stocks. So let's look at the market the last seven days again, driven by tech, Amazon, Tesla, Meta, Apple, Microsoft, Nvidia, TSM that makes chips all hot because of the AI revolution. Let's look at year to date because this puts everything in perspective. My whole black hole theory. It's only a few names that generate all the returns. And here, this is the S&P 500. And you can see all the green boxes that drove the entire market so far this year. While you have, you know, other companies down, whether it's energy, drug companies, banks, etc. The market's driven by Microsoft, Apple, Nvidia, Google, Meta, Amazon, Tesla, um, little Lily as well. Uh, hit a dark green, one of the pharma exceptions. So that's kind of how we play in the importance of looking at these markets. So we're going to start with the good news today because there is more good news than normal. We're going to start with some stacking information. And uh, I did touch on this in DCA yesterday, but here you can see very clearly and some people, and I hope people can see these colors clearly. So red is when a cohort sells and blue is when they buy Bitcoin. Now at the very top, you've got greater than 10,000 Bitcoin holders, then one to 10 K, 100 Bitcoin to 1000 Bitcoin. Then you got 10 to 100, one to 10 and less than one. And what's been staggering so far in the month of May First of all, it started off with the greater than 10,000 whales buying. Then they hit the pause button for about a week and then started buying again. That basically represents all of what's happening in May. And that's what I want to get across to people. I think everybody is so PTSD out from what we just went through with the nasty bear market and the black swans. People are taking profit. It's like, oh, I'm up 20% of Bitcoin and they sell it. I'm going to buy back in at 10,000 or 15,000 or whatever they think it's going to go to or when it goes back under 20K. But be careful because when you look at what the big guys are doing with the 10,000 plus Bitcoin, they know it's going up. And let me show you some more on-chain stuff that supports that thesis as well. This one shows you, and it's a little bit of a gradual change, not as much of a contrast to the other, but this is from Sentiment. And basically, it says the addresses holding between 10 and 10,000 Bitcoin. And remember, there's a big difference between, say, 10 up to 5,000 and 5,000 plus. They bundle them in together. And what I do want to mention here is 
the view of data can be different from data organizations. So what Sentiment sees can be very different to what the block sees, can be very different to what Glassnode sees. It all depends on how you slice it and dice the data. And that's why when we pull in data, we like to have multiple sources of the same piece of data to get the right answer and create a blend in between, because sometimes it can be off. But just to put into, this into contrast here, you can see the, the whales or and less, i.e. those with 10 Bitcoin plus to 10,000, have been staying cautious despite the market, you know, bouncing between 26K and 30K over the last month. Regardless, they have accumulated about not, uh, just shy of 100,000 Bitcoin as prices fell from 30 down to 26.5. They saw that as an opportunity. So the address is holding 10 to 10,000 Bitcoin uh, at 93,000 Bitcoin more than they had seven weeks ago. So again, you know, are you a 10 Bitcoin plus gatherer? If so, you've been doing well here. And what's happening is the retail less than 10 Bitcoin are selling to these folks. And that's sad because the miners are also accumulating now. They stopped selling because they know the price is going to go up from here. Let's talk about the long-term holder spend, another on-chain chart. Thank you, Zeno. Well, <laughs> this is nice. There's three little colors again. Hope everybody can see the colors. Okay, this is from Glassnode. You've got pink and you have yellow and you have green. All right, so we went through pink. Pink is typically a bear market. It's a nasty time. That is, uh, make sure I can see this properly, get the times and dates and everything else. So pink is typically when the price of Bitcoin is less than the cost basis of the average holder. So that means on average, everybody is kind of losing money from their acquisition price of Bitcoin. Then you have yellow and the yellow period is what we are in now, which means I've been talking for a long time since November that we are probably in a bull market. We've missed, we've out of the bottom out of the doldrums, out of the horrible periods. And here we are. Now, if you look at 2017 to 2018 cycle, we had a long period of yellow, a really long period and a little period of green. And in the older cycle, 2013, 2014, we had a longer period of green. So the point is we are now in the yellow, which means the cost basis is less than the price, which means everybody's in the money which is less than the all time high. <laughs> so we haven't had anywhere near kind of a blow off top. And we're not going to get to that till we get to 69K again. But the point is, when you look at this beautiful chart, it tells you not only where you are, but where you're going, <laughs> which is very important. So for people to be selling in the yellow before the green is, you know, we could have a little bit of sideways action, etc. But the green is coming when it comes based on this. It could be after, of course, April 2024. So be patient, another 10 months or so. Uh, let's look at the Bitcoin R HODL ratio, another beautiful chart, which really tells you of exactly how this market works. And I love this as well because, uh, well, let me give you some background as to where this came from. This came from uh, Willy Wu uh, back in 2020, and it measures the rate of Bitcoin held over one week to those held over one to two years, so not the day traders, that people are stacking for over a week to one to two years. And the ratio, the R huddle ratio, is a leading indicator of tops and bottoms. And we like tops and bottoms here on this channel. And when the ratio is high, it suggests there's a lot of selling pressure from short-term holders, and this can lead to a price decline. And when the ratio is low, it suggests there's a lot of buying pressure from long-term holders, and this can lead to a price rally. And the R hard ratio continues to climb as the transfer of wealth from experienced investors to newer market participants perpetuates a mechanical, typical cycle transition, whatever you want to call it. So if you look at this and look at the chart, you've got your pink, again, same type of color as our red, wealth transferring to mature coins. Then you go to the equilibrium, which can happen at the bottom and at the top. That's why it's so good at finding bottoms and tops. And this is part of our tabby model as well. And then you go green. And this is wealth transferring to young coins. So think of the pink as when the big guys stack. And the green is when the big guys move their coins to the new market entrance, the newbies. And that's basically <laughs> the picture I've tried to paint is this one and this one fit like hand and glove together as you go forward. Now we're going to talk about the story of the day. This is a key 
key ratio, which we broke down under for the first time in history during the last bear. This is the 200-week moving average. Remember, 200 weeks is approximately five years, ladies and gentlemen. And the red line here is the 200-week average for Bitcoin. And you can see that histor historically, you know, 2015, 2016, 2018, 2019, etc., 2020, early back in March, you bounced perfectly off that 200-week moving average. In fact, we pierced it a little bit. And then all the black swans happened. And that caught many of us by surprise as well, because we thought the bottom was in, and then another black swan happened. The bottom was in, and another black swan. Part of that is because we were misled by the 200-week moving average. Sol Strider, got some Sol news coming for you in a minute. Thank you. But what's important about this is when we cross the 200-week over with the 50-week and never before, we came close late 2015, but never before have we actually pierced the 200-week moving average in red with the green line, which is a 50-week moving average. So this one, we went through, and that is a death cross. Now, what's interesting, and we've talked about this before, a death cross doesn't necessarily mean the market goes down. So you can see when this death cross actually happened, the market fell, but only for a few days, and then it bounced right back up again. It's been crazy. But right now, we are scheduled. If we go forward, one more chart. Sometime August 2023, that green will pierce the red. And that means typically 65 to 70% of the time, when we get a gold cross, I, the short term crossing the longer term line, we will go bonkers. So that could be good. And, you know, August is normally a quiet time in the market, low volume participants are elsewhere on the beach or whatever. But this could be another catalyst that we're looking at as we go forward. Mr. Keyframes, thank you so much. Um, and by the way, we covered a lot of stuff here is 40 plus nuggets. We do have for less than 15 cents, a paper, uh, the most comprehensive sub stack ever. And we just hit 3000, although most of them are free accounts. And of course, proceeds go to our writers from the community as well. So if you're interested in spending five minutes every day catching up on what I cover in the videos with all the slides and the podcast. You can get that here too. Now let's talk about Bitcoin season. We are still in Bitcoin season. You can see here we are down at four again, <laughs> like all time record low we haven't seen since 2019. Boom. It is crazy how low it goes. Um, but you've got to remember the Bitcoin market, this chart is based off the top 50 altcoins versus Bitcoin. Who's winning? Who's performing? So if if Bitcoin beats 25 and loses against 25, it'll be right bang in the middle. And right now, Bitcoin's crushing most. These are the names it's actually crushing. And if you look to this chart here on the left, again, it's Bitcoin versus the top 50 altcoins over the last 90 days. You can see all the stuff down on the right is stuff that we are very good at identifying. We're very good in this channel at identifying what we call poop coins. And because um, we don't we don't use bad language on this channel either. But you can see over the last 90 days where the market's gone wild, you have Filecoin down 33%, Stacks down 34%, Aptos 36%, Ape 37%, Flow 37%, Algorand nearly 40% down. And that's a sign when you have a market that's going wild and the old coins are going down, bleeding badly against it, that's always a very ominous sign. So these could be yesteryear's coins, kind of like back in 2017, and look at those coins today that we covered last week. So let's talk about the weekend pump and what actually happened. Well, debt ceiling was approved on Saturday, and the market bounced. Uh, now, it also caught, caught a few people by surprise. Crypto, crypto AI, I thought it was crypto for a sec. Um, but a short squeeze over the weekend, because it did catch people by surprise, was fueled by the debt ceiling agreement. And we knew the stock market would go crazy on Tuesday, and it did that as well. But again, it's the big names that are jumping first. And some of the Bitcoin proxies actually did very well too. And this here, you can see this debt ceiling development will you know, result in some volatility, I think, next week. This week, we also have the, you know Hong Kong opening to retail investors slowly as of June 1st. We also, by the other fun stuff that was happening over the weekend, Erdogan, uh, the president of Turkey, got re-elected. And the Turkish population tends to score among the highest crypto adopters on Earth. 
because they are sick of inflation. I'll talk about how the Turkish lira is going to die probably in the very near future. And that is the story of today. And that's why I do this, because fiat is dangerous to hold on to, everybody. Very dangerous to hold on to. And I'll show you in a couple of charts under the ugly section, a little bit about the Turkish lira. Now, in other news, uh, Solana just flipped Matic Polygon in market cap. This They've been going back and forth for a year or two now, but it's good that Solana's back up in ninth spot, climbing up. You can see the... I put in fully diluted market cap and market cap because it's very, very important. When you look at some of the new coins that are out there that have like 5% of their tokens issued, they're just going to dump on you for years and years and years into the future. We'll talk more about those in a few minutes too. But here you can see the fully diluted market cap is 11.7 for Solana, Matic about 9. And the existing market cap is 8.4 versus 8.5 approximately. But you still have Cardano at 13.2. And the Cardano fully delivered market cap is nearly 50% higher than that of Solana. So a long way for Solana to catch up with Cardano. But now we'll share some new dashboards to give you an interesting perspective. First one it is devs per the top three chains. Again, we look at the chains that have the most daily active users. You know my shopping mall analogy. And there was a huge spike in a couple of developing activities. You see Matic at 714 developers in April. Developers actively working in the ecosystem in April 2023 for Matic, 1234 for Solana. And of course, the big 800 pound gorilla, nearly 6,000 working on Ethereum. But remember, Ethereum is a beast. And Ethereum also trades at 25 times the market cap of Solana. So if you look at just market cap perspectives of developers to market cap, which is what we do as well, and here they are, the new dashboards. It's a very, very important statistic to look at. So here, if you look at the first one, we have daily transactions over daily active addresses. Big thank you to DJ for helping me put all this stuff together. Um, you have uh, Cardano runs about 1.3 transactions per user. And Sol has about 56 transactions per user, but Cardano has one and a half times the market cap. The point is the chain is stickier. People do more on the chain across different dApps, etc., And that's important. On the right hand side here, you see market cap per developer. Um, again, if you want an example, Cardano is about 23 million versus 2 million for Solana. So you want as many developers per million dollars of market cap as possible. And this is based on existing market cap. So you things like, see things like Sui, uh, Kaida High, and some of the new names like Optimism. But if you put that against fully diluted market cap, it'd be a very, very different situation. So the next time you see this dashboard, it will be based on FDMC. So let's talk about global liquidity because this drives a lot of the action. And here you can see that money, monetary and fiscal liquidity drives the price of assets like Bitcoin. So US is in green, blue is global liquidity, and black is Bitcoin. And look how they track. That's why we are having a little bit of a dip right now in US liquidity. That's the green line falling off. But thanks to the debt ceiling, that's going to be going up again soon. And that means the Bitcoin price will be going up again soon. It's that simple, everybody. I wish it was more scientific, but it's not. Um, let's look at Ethereum. We have now just shy of 100 million non-zero addresses in Ethereum. That's the blue line up and to the right. I think the exact number is 99,964,000 or something. Like we're just almost there. So I'm going to call it a 100 million non-zero addresses. And what's impressive about this is how the bear market did not slow down crypto adoption. This is good news. Um, also, fear and greed, we went from 50 to 51. Tiny little bump since I did this a week ago. But again, just like the volume, flatlined. And it's good because neutral is fine. We don't want to be fearful and we don't want to be too greedy either because greed is bad. So being in the middle is a positive area. Let's talk about decoupling news. This is uh, what I touched on last week. The Bitcoin Nasdaq performance over the rolling 90-day period is converging. QQQ, 13.55% versus Bitcoin, 17%. Obviously, Bitcoin had a huge bump in the early months of this year. Uh, January, February went massive. 
and it was a huge decoupling. But now it looks like tech is catching up because of the AI revolution. So let's talk about some more positive news in the space. And, you know, you can't make all this positive news stuff up, but this is good. I mean, first of all, Tether, um, a lot of people expected last year that Tether could probably blow up. Well, it didn't. Now it's highly profitable thanks to the very high interest rates because they sit on $82 million, a huge chunk of it to catch 5% return on, which is a lot of money, <laughs> nearly $100 billion. But they also are allocating 15% of their profits to buying Bitcoin. And I calculated, I think last week it was, that that means they'd be buying 6% of all the Bitcoin that's being mined by the miners by just this one little stable coin. And that is crazy good. In addition, they now said they're going to start mining Bitcoin with renewable energy. So for the ESG people out there, don't worry. They're going to do it in Uruguay using hydroelectric power, which is awesome. And that will help them really bolster kind of their whole stable coin. They're plowing tons of money into an asset that's going up in value, which will make them even more profitable, even more stable. So all the tether FUD blow is just gone away, which is great for the space. A uh, quick bit of news on Tesla. Well, we know Model Y is now the best number one selling car in the world, the most cost efficient car. Uh, sadly, a, a friend of mine went and, you know, he's in San Francisco and he went and bought an ID4. I said, why didn't you buy a Tesla Model Y? He said, he thinks German cars are better. Uh, and I didn't <laughs> I didn't want to tell him about the, the credit he could have gotten and everything else. And his family would have qualified. So it was a bit of a sad situation. But I wasn't going to rub it in. Too late, he bought. But not many people are buying those cars. But Kathy Wood did say Tesla has the most to gain from AI uh, in the recent breakthroughs in the whole space. And she believes as well they will be the first to solve autonomous driving and robot taxis, whether it be late this year, 2024, or at the very latest, 2025. It'll be huge. And once that happens, you're going to see the biggest explosion in stock valuation in the history of the earth. So it's going to be exciting. Um, let's talk about the bad news, though, everybody. It's important to be fair and balanced, and there is some bad news, and there's a lot of ugly news, too. So for the sixth week running, we saw outflows out of the digital assets space. And these are funds that take in assets all over the world and they're tracked by coin shares. Now, the total outflow is 39 million. Again, I expected last week with the trend that was there for it to be less than that, but it wasn't. Again, the total for the last six weeks out of digital funds is 272 million. But the focus remains on Bitcoin with outflows of 11 million. The short Bitcoin lost exactly 11 million as well. So they were kind of balanced. And the run of outflows is far more dramatic, though, for the short Bitcoin fund. They lost 36% of asset under management over the last couple of weeks. So that means nobody's going short, everybody's going long, which is actually bullish. So you can always find a bit of good news in the ugly news and the bad news, too. Let's look at flows by asset. Uh, here you can see altcoins. They actually let me go back for a second. I forgot to mention one thing. When you go back to this chart here. Uh, what's crazy is despite six weeks of outflows of funds, primarily Bitcoin, the Bitcoin price has been stable. Can you imagine what will happen when these funds start taking the money again? Wow, it'll be crazy. So that's that one. Now, this one is the flows by asset. Again, the old coins have been a little bit insulated from the negative sentiment and the fears, etc. Uh, but no, most notable were Algorand, which saw 65% of asset under management outflow last week. I've been talking about uh, how it's not a good asset for a long time. That is huge. So not only are people getting out of short Bitcoin, but they're also getting out of Algorand. 65% and the number uh, for uh, the short Bitcoin was about the same too. So two thirds of the money was taken out of those funds, which is stunning. Now, Litecoin, did see an uptick and XRP 100K, but Litecoin 500,000. And why is that? What's going on with Litecoin? You know, breaking the trend. So typically when something breaks a trend like that, there must be something positive happening. And there is. This is Litecoin. And you can see Litecoin, they are having, an, uh, having I think, on the 5th of August, 2023. It could be the 4th, could be the 6th, but probably the 5th. Now, this means that the block reward for mining will reduce from 12.5 Litecoin to 6.25 Litecoin, just like what will happen to Bitcoin. Um, they'll be cut in half. And the halving schedule event happens every four years, just like Bitcoin. And it's designed to reduce the supply of Litecoin, which makes it more scarce. And typically, 
after the halving, the price shoots up because the halving reduces the supply. And if the demand stays the same, the price will go up. Thank you so much, Viciously. So Litecoin, for those little traders out there, could be worth a dabble, but watch your TA very carefully to determine your entry point, not financial advice. Of course, let's talk about stablecoins again. This is kind of crazy, and this is reflective of the overall market. Despite the price action going up, volume is down. Not only trading volume, spot volume for, for crypto, but also stablecoin market has been shrinking for 14 consecutive months. Total market cap of stablecoins dropped to 130 billion in May, and this is the lowest level since way early 2021, which is crazy. And why do we care? Well, stable coins are a key part of the digital asset universe, but their decline is a sign of capital draining from the space. And sometimes when, you know, stable coin will fall in market cap when people lose confidence in it, or there's a thing like choke point in the USA, which hurts things like Circle, USDC, but... Tether is not really affected here, but the overall volume is. And also when you see the drainage happening for stable coins, it means the money is going somewhere else, probably into Bitcoin. So the money may be coming out of the funds over the last six weeks, but the stable coins here gradually could be trickling into Bitcoin and other assets. So this is, you know, again, bad news, but good news as well at the same time. Uh, let's talk about another bit of bad news for all our friends up there in Canada. They are bracing for impact. I had a question this morning on this one because I hinted at it yesterday. And we have a lot of people just like uh, Australians and New Zealanders and Canadians and the British. They all love their crypto. But this is kind of a macro ding that's happening. And I thought this was a fantastic chart to share because if you look at Canada, UK, US, households are completely dependent on real estate for their major source of wealth, and therefore they borrow a ton to make that happen. Now, the key part here is you can see Canada's off the charts, wins the list for G7 of having the most household debt to buy real estate. And that is over 110, 115% of Canadian GDP. That is massive. And that means over half of the Canadian economy is dependent on real estate. If anything happens to the real estate market in Canada, that could be ugly. By the way, I will be doing my real estate, uh, global real estate update this week, uh, as much as I wanted to do it last week, but there was so much other stuff happening. I couldn't. Um, <clears throat> so let me know what countries you want to touch on as well down below. But this is from uh, Gergaman. He said, for the first time in history, the majority of new condo investors in Toronto are losing money. That has never happened. You buy a condo in Canada, it's like throwing a rock at a bag of money. You're going to do well, but this is not good. They are losing money. They are underwater. They are not profitable. Many of them are sitting empty and the costs are through the roof, especially with rising interest rates. And this could be one big house of cards. And this is why the Canadian banks are bracing for default. And I hope they're wrong, but uh, I can't remember the exact number. I read it somewhere and I forgot to write it down. But between $3.6 and $5 billion is what the Canadian banks have allocated to prepare for the storm that they believe is coming. Not just Toronto, but also Vancouver and maybe some other markets too. So watch out there. And this could also happen in other places where the speculative market's into real estate. So we'll cover that later this week. Um, now, time for the ugly news. Always some ugly news. Last week, the uh, <laughs> the losers last week were Ape, Algorand, and ICP. Now, it's interesting to see the fact that uh, Algorand is there. So when you look at these kind of macro, who does the best, who does the worst, it is also reflective of how the assets are performing. Again, we pull in data from different sources to verify our thesis, and Algorand got completely smashed uh, from an institutional perspective as well. But Filecoin did well. And look, year to date. Filecoin up 55%. So that one is doing well too. Quant, XRP, with hope that uh, the case will be solved. But we just want to focus on the bottom three here. Now, this is staggering. This is what I call dumpage. This is what I call raining tokens, uh, big unlocks. Um, and this, I, I just have to stress this. And a lot of people like this new segment, especially when they find out they're holding some of them. So we mentioned Filecoin has done very well year to date. Let's go back to that slide. You can see they're up 55% year to date. But there's a storm coming, ladies and gentlemen. So we'll start with this list. And I'm just looking at the million plus dumpage per day per asset. Uniswap, 
2.3 million will be dumped per day. Polka dot, sorry. Polka dot, 2 million per day. Filecoin, 1.8 million per day. That's a lot of tokens. Uh, Cosmos, 1.6 million per day. Avalanche, 1.4 million per day. Dogecoin, 1 million a day. And then going all the way down to near protocol, 800,000 just shy. Of course, you've got your typical immutable X, your sweat coins and step-ins and all those move-to-earn stuff as well are in there. But I just wanted to highlight this week the big multi-million dollar dumpages. And this will bring things down as we go forward. So be careful of that if you do hold those. Now, optimism, just touching on this for a second. Let it rain. Optimism. Over the past 42 hours, uh, Wintermute has moved 2.651 million optimism to Binance at about $1.65 on average. And basically, a huge amount will be unlocked in the next few hours. So to explain, well, first of all, Wintermute is a crypto market maker, quant trading firm based out of Zurich, Switzerland, my place where I used to live. And uh, what they are doing is obviously they've invested early. Their tokens are being unlocked. They have them all. They're moving them to Binance. Because you know what they're going to do? They're going to make it rain tokens. That's going to bring the price down. So be careful. Uh, if there was liquidity enough for me to short it, I would. But that's why you got to watch this stuff, everybody. Crypto is the Wild West. These VCs and investors take no prisoners, everybody. And we have 18 to 48 hours or 42 hours to, for this stuff to hit the potential market. So again, it's important to watch what's happening on chain and where the tokens are going because Wintermute is not moving their optimism tokens to Binance for safety. No, they're moving them to ditch them because that's where the liquidity is. Okay, so be careful if you hold optimism. Um, now let's talk about money. Nine years from now, <laughs> this is such a sad pink chart. We had a lot of pink colors today, actually. But uh, this is from a government source, the CBOE. Federal debt by public is projected to rise from whatever it is now, approximately 110, 120% of GDP to... In 2023, which is only nine years from now, or sorry, 2033, uh, to over 200%. And basically, you've heard me saying many, many times, fiat has a half-life of 10 years. So if you have $100,000, you can buy $100,000 worth of stuff today. 10 years from now, you'll be able to buy $50,000 of stuff for the same $100,000. That's what I mean by half-life. Your purchasing power is cut in half every 10 years. But with this, it'll probably be even worse because if the government is projecting they're going to double the debt to GDP, you know it's going to be a lot worse than that. And that's what we call QE to infinity. So buckle in, everybody. Get some hard assets. Even if it is a condo in Toronto, you'll do better than holding fiat. Uh, let's talk about another angle too. So this is a quick view of all the assets on Earth because we did touch on real estate. Now we're going to talk about bonds. Obviously, gold there is $12 tr trillion. Art, I didn't believe art was bigger than gold, but I guess there's some expensive paintings in there and such. Equities, 115 trillion. Money, that's fiat, 120 trillion. That stuff on the right is just going to be printed to infinity, so it'll keep on going up, but the value of it will keep on going down. Total global assets, 900 trillion. But the key here is, I do believe, and I've been thinking a lot about this lately, and other people have been thinking about it too, but what sparked my interest was, was a tweet Sanjay shared with me, and it was the fact that maybe, maybe Bitcoin is going to go after the bond market. And I mentioned that to Ivan on tech yesterday. And he said, well, probably the ETH market too, or the ETH market, because ETH already has a return on it. And it's on an asset that is deflationary and going up in value. So would you rather buy something that has a coupon, i.e. interest return, on a bond, on an asset that's going down in value? or the same return on assets going up in value. And that's why many believe that if you look at that big gray box there, I'll pop it up again, 300 trillion, crypto could be going for this. And let me explain my method as to why I believe it could happen. Uh, one, there are a number of factors. Obviously, QE to infinity we just touched about. Rates will fall again, which means ETH will offer a higher rate than the rates that bonds will offer. Uh, crypto is also more popular amongst younger generations. You, you won't find anybody under 40 buying a bond. Uh, also, crypto has lack of regulations. 
which could be seen as a good or bad thing. But for people that are investing in bonds, they don't want to invest in a heavily regulated bond market if they want to keep things private. And this could also make it much more attractive for people to avoid government oversight, especially with the advent of central bank digital currencies. I think Japan just had a successful CBDC pilot as well, which is kind of scary times. So this could be the new bond market driven by crypto. This is why it's an exponential era. That's why people couldn't believe the exponentiality of NVIDIA last week. That's what's happening, and it's exciting. So let's talk about another ugly picture. This is uh, from the conference board, and it's a set of leading indicators. And it's declined by 9% from its all-time high. And it indicates a clear signal of an upcoming recession. So if you look at where this teal blue line strikes through, that line, the little gray dotted line, every time it does that without fail, there is a gray bar, which is a recession. Okay, we're going back to 1970, 1973, 1974, 1980, 1983, 1990, 2000, 2001, global financial crisis, 2008, 2009. We had the C-19 crisis, 2020, March 2020. And now we are here again. So either money printing from crazy happens fast and interest rates cuts are slashed fast to ensure a soft landing, or we're going to a recession. And top capital allocators on earth say that is actually possible too. And penultimate piece of news today. I told you this. Actually, I thought I lied at the beginning. I said there was 40 nuggets. There's 45. So five more than normal. Um, but this is the Turkish Central Bank Net Reserves. We know the US uh, Federal Reserves, their checking account is running empty. But this one is running negative. <laughs> so Turkey doesn't have no money. It's got minus money out there. And uh, Reuters and other news agencies are jumping on the bearish lira, Turkish lira bandwagon, reporting that the Turkish central bank's net forex reserves have dropped for the first time ever in nearly 25 years, standing at minus $151 million as of a few days ago, following Erdogan's strict orders. Okay, he is now the new president again, and he scrambled to counter demand for hard currencies. And this is why Turkish people, I hope they're all okay. But that's why they're crazy for Bitcoin and crypto, because they know it's safe. They know the lira is going to zero and it's going to implode really fast. There is simply no money in the kitty, which is crazy. And another piece of bad news, which makes me very sad to see for our friends in the United Kingdom. And a big thank you to Sanjay for sharing this too. But what's interesting, I'm sure it's the same all over the world as well, whether it's Australia or US or Canada or Germany or wherever, South Africa. But you look at here, the inflation for different types of food. You've got food in general. Then you have shop price food, <laughs> non-food, of course. There's not that much inflation for non-food, just above 5%. I don't even know what ambient food is, maybe frozen, I don't know. And then you have fresh food, the green one. We need to stay healthy. In order to stay healthy, you need to eat fresh food. But if it's the most expensive food, people aren't going to buy it and therefore they're going to get unhealthy, which is very sad. So this is uh, scary that inflation for fresh food is still the highest out there. So that'll make people buy crud like McDonald's instead of carrots and spinach. So with that, everybody, hope you enjoy the KPM. Thank you as well to everybody in the community. Come in and join. <laughs> a fun time is had by all. So thank you all for being here. Thank you to the mods in the chat. Sorry for being a long show today, but we had a lot of ground to cover. God, 40 minutes. 45 nuggets in 40 minutes, though, isn't bad. So thank you all, and I'll see you all tomorrow again. See you later. Bye.